know her. She's practicing this morning. I'm in the office going over things, and and uh, I came out looking at the piano while she was playing, trying to find what was wrong with it, Miss Aaron. I heard I kept hearing this clicking, like I thought it was made that the, the pedals were like I was have to go get oil or something. <laughs> it was her nails. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter six. I got lots of scripture to go through. Amen. And and and. Amen. So get your thing. What? How do you call it? Finger. Uh, Calisthenics, am I saying that right? And uh, we'll, we'll get to flipping here. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. It says, go to the ant, thou sluggard. Man, that, that's already offensive to the millennial crowd. Uh, well, they're already calling us names. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that tra- traveleth and, and, is, and they want as an armed man. Church, there's a lot that we can learn from creation. Uh, if we just take time to see it, both with our own eyes, but also through the eyes of Scripture. My dad has a whole series of, of character sketch books that... that uh, my mom and dad would teach us as we we're going through homeschool, and it was um, I don't know who, who who sponsored or who put that out, but these big it's like it's like a set of encyclopedia books, but they're character sketches, and what they are is um, um, animals throughout creation. It'd be like one is like the bear, and all the principles that we can learn from a bear and from an eagle and from an ant and from whatever whatever animal. Biblical lessons that we can learn from these animals. And when you learn about these animals while you're doing it, how God created them for, for different reasons and created how they uh, defend themselves and attack and all these things. You learn about these animals but biblical principles that come from them. We live in a society in an age, and I'm speaking as a young man that grew up with technology and all these things. I fully acknowledge it, but um, we live in this city. We barely even see the stars. We don't pay attention to the bees buzzing hardly. We don't pay attention to these things, but there's a lot we can learn from it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 25. You're not too far. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 25. It says, The ants are strong, or the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. The spire taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. I know from experience that Rachel was encouraged one day, I think it was a year ago, just saying, hey, look, even the king's palaces have spiders. Amen. Uh, Brother Raleigh, would you open us in a word of prayer as we get into the message, sir? Amen. If we could, can you turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Hebrews chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Much scripture. I'll try to go through it quickly. I'm off to a later start than normal. I'll be like the micro machines man. You guys remember that old commercial? <laughs> that was so cool when I was a kid. Amen. This morning, we're not going to be talking about spiders or ants or conies. Uh, by the way, conies aren't coney dogs. Those are uh, in, in the Middle East. That's it looks like a rabbit, acts like a rabbit, even though it's not in the rabbit family. They live amongst the rocks, and uh, it's a whole thing, amen. But, um, but um, conies, I, if, it sounds funny because we're not used to that name around here. It sounds like ponies, but with the sea, amen. This morning, we're going to be talking about Canadian geese. What, what do we know about Canadian geese other than they won't get out of the road when they're crossing, and if you get too close to them, they're going to goose you. That's where that came from, Amen. Point number one, they fly together. We know this. They got this, they got this V formation. You know, they didn't go to geese school to learn that. That's instinctive. Not through an evolutionary process, but through creation. God gave them that instinct to, to fly in a V pattern. That's not an accident. And, and, and we know that what, how an airplane takes off, right? It gets enough air thrust. I think that's the right terminology at a certain point, and it 
gives them lift from the air. The same thing happens with the geese, right? They're flying in, they're flying in a V. So you got the lead uh, goose, and he's taking the brunt of it, right? He's flapping. He's working the hardest. But from his flapping, he's creating an airlift behind him, which is giving relief for the goose behind him, which is giving relief for the goose behind him, and so on and so forth. So they're not just randomly flying in a V, but they have this formation, and it's given them this, 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 this amount of uh, relief when they're flying. And it's not just something random. Some scientists some years ago, I think it was in the early 90s, did a study. They said it was 71% relief for the geese when, one's, uh, when you're flying behind another goose. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So it's not, it's not just by accident. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's designed by God. Flying in a V doesn't only just, you know, uh, help you with you go much further, right? But it's also um, letting it, you, you got a formation. You're letting you each have a spot to be in, right? And when you each have a spot to be in, now you have a lead goose. So now, so now the lead goose is taking you where you want to go, as opposed to having ten geese trying to lead. You never get anywhere. Amen. Number one, they fly together. Number two, they stay with the flock. You say, Pastor Gunther, you didn't have no scripture for the first point. I will make it up to you in the next couple, I promise. Amen. Number two, they stay, they stay with the flock. As soon as they get out of formation now, we know it makes it 71% easier for them to fly behind somebody else when they're working together. But so what happens when they get out of formation? Well, all of a sudden, it's 71% harder. So they're, as soon as they're out of that V, they're encouraged to get right back in, whether they're getting tired or not. I don't know if you ever jog with somebody. Uh, you got to keep pace with them. Uh, I was working with Rob Wilson one time, and it was a hot, sunny day. My brother John, my nail gun quit working. Thank you very much. And uh, we had to hand drive on this barn, and it was a lot of hand driving to do. And we were dying. But we set a pace, and we were keeping it. And I wasn't going to let him know how tired I was. I couldn't let that happen. I had to act like it was no big deal. But there's a pace that's set, and if you get behind that pace, the person you're with is going to say, hey, you know, come on, let's go. Let's keep up the pace a little bit. Number two, they, they stay with the flock. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, 23. I think God knew what he was doing when he gave us this verse. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. How many times do we wake up on a Sunday morning and think, man, I've got a headache and like it's going to be hard to go today? Or on a Wednesday, and that Wednesdays was always the hardest for me. Uh, I was always trying to get some side job in or working overtime in. You get home and you got 10 minutes to be there. Brother Tony's living it right now. He's got to work from 1 to 5 today. It's hard. You got to make this decision. Well, what am I going to do today? So it's a decision, well, what do I want to get? What do I get out of it? Stop that. First of all, it's going to be so much harder going off on your own without any encouragement or relief from the flock, amen. But man, did you ever consider everybody else? Did you consider my children when you thought, yeah, I don't want to go in today? It's not just the pastor. It's the whole church. It's those kids that are like, oh, yeah, they're not here today. They're not here today. Or for whatever it is, whatever the function is or whatnot and and i'm and and we get migraines we get sick sometimes we have to work overtime i'm not talking i'm talking i'm talking about the, the 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 regular stuff when you look for reasons not to come amen first corinthians chapter 12 verse 12 you know we're all made up of the body of christ whether you like it or not if you're born into the family you're born in the family if my boys uh, uh, are tired of being in the Gunther family, I'm sorry, but you're going to be in the Gunther family to the day you die. That's just the way it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, For the body is one and hath many members. What are we talking about? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. So if you're saved, this is talking about you and me, right? And all the members of that uh, one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be of Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? So often, uh, uh, you know, people say, well, that's the pastor's job. Well, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will clean the church. Somebody else will cut the grass. So, Aren't we all one body? And I'm preaching mostly to the choir here because pretty much everybody here is doing something in the church and has some ministry and we all work together, amen. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, uh, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Not everybody can be the hand. Not everybody can be the nose. And all the hands that think the nose just hasn't made in the shade don't realize all the, the, the bummer things that come with being the nose. And all the people that are the nose that thinks they wish they were the hand, you get where I'm going with this. 21, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again uh, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. That, 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 that pinky toe that we stub and we hate doing that. Having a toothache is just a little thing in the body, but it'll shut the whole body down. I don't, I don't know of a more annoying, frustrating pain than tooth pain. I just don't. It, it's bad, and it'll take you down. One little thing, Brother Raleigh. Verse 23, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow uh, more abundant honor, and, and our uncomely parts have more abundant uh, comeliness. Uh, for our comely parts have no need, but, but God hath tempered the body together, ha having given uh, more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Hey, the Wilsons moved. We did all we could to help them out. That's awesome. Some of us had to work and some of us couldn't do it. Some of us were sick. But if we could, we helped them out. Amen. We stayed home until they called us and said it was done, which is a bunch of us. Amen. Number three, geese, geese share the work. Geese share the work. Turn to Psalms 133. Did you guys know that when the lead geese gets tired, and I'm sure most of you know that these facts, but when the lead geese, a goose gets tired, he falls back in the formation and another goose comes and takes the lead up front. They just instinctively work together. What a blessing that is. It's been a blessing. It's been a blessing uh, seeing our church family come together, unified, uh, doing something for the cause of Christ. Uh, I'm not just talking about the nativity. We're unified in that. That's great. I'm talking about in general, just church services and loving on one another, uh, faithfulness and uh, uh, decorating the church, just, just these things. We're going to the flea markets. What a blessing. We're doing that as a church. It's not just a pastor and two people. That's often how it goes, y'all. But as a church, by and large, we're doing things together and we're growing together. I'm not talking about the weight we gained over Thanksgiving. Amen. But, man, men have been stepping up and helping get things done uh, without being asked. <sighs> what a blessing. that I've been trying to teach my boys that. It's a blessing when you just do something, when you see a need, instead of waiting to be asked. I, <sighs> Amen. And they're learning, too. Amen. Amen. But it's a blessing. We've been seeing that around here, and, and women have been stepping up, uh, taking care of needs without being asked. And, uh, amen. Amen. Well, we're short on nursery workers, and, and, and we don't have a, a, a set schedule for every service. Um, but our women have been helping greatly, volunteering, just stepping in. And we can't cover all the time, but, amen, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. We're working together. Uh, you, you think I'm joking, but I mean it with all my heart. I wish I could help out in the nursery just to be a help. I mean it. And I know some other men feel the same. I, 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 love, our, I love our church work days. Uh, I, I really do. I know it sounds crazy. And what's the deal with the hottest day of the year? Let's, let's, we're going to gonna do it in the springtime from now on. No more June business. Um, but I love our church work days because we have a huge attendance. 
you guys realize that there's been a lot of years uh, here and at other churches where, like, you get three or four or five people to a work church day, and you've been planning it for months, you know. People, by and large, aren't so unified is what I'm telling you, Hope Baptist Church is when it comes to work days. Amen. Psalms 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's nothing worse than when somebody's in the church that got awed against another brother. They're better at them for something. Because they didn't do something or they did do something or whatever. They disagree with them on some front. So they're going to hold bitterness over them. And they think that, they think that it only affects them. No, oh, it affects the whole church. The bitterness that Miss Ruby might have for Noah or Ben might have for Jessica or whoever it might be, it affects the church. Do you know that affects our worship? You guys realize that? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.11. We're going to be turning this morning. I'm trying to move quickly, amen. I'm telling you this morning that geese have enough sense uh, uh, to know that there's strength in unity. Every born-again believer that struggles with unfaithfulness would do good to understand this. Man, the, the benefits of unity. Number four, geese encourage one another. Those geese are loud when they're flying. I love it. I, I'm not like a goose hunter or nothing. I would, but um, I, I love the sound of geese flying. I love the sound of ducks flying. I still love the sound of nature, amen. But when those geese are flying, there's a twofold thing going on. Number one, uh, they're in formation. They're quacking, letting the goose know in front of them, hey, I'm behind you. And they're encouraging one another with that, right? Um, lost my brain for a minute. It's, it's a twofold. It's letting them know that they're there. Because think about it. If you're 10 feet that way, all of a sudden, you, if the goose behind you is way over there, you're starting to think, wait, which direction are we going? Am I supposed to be over there? No, but you're letting them know you're in that V and you're staying together, but it's also encouraging one another. Just, you know, anyone, especially that works outside, and pretty much every man here has from one time or another, but I know that, that, man, on a hot day or a cold day, the worst part of the day isn't getting out of your car in the morning. That's the second worst part of the day. The worst part of the day is right after lunch when you just got warmed up and you're going right back out and your socks aren't completely dry yet. Or it's just, man, to get back out in that heat or get back out in that cold. So what do you do? You suck each other up. You know, and I'm serious. You, you psych each other up and, and you, you, you know, you encourage one another to go at it and you, uh, you see who can shingle up to this side first and you challenge each other and there's a mental game that happens. Amen. I had a easier time, and I'm not making fun of, I'm, I'm dead serious. I had an easier time uh, in general um, mentally working out in the snow every day than I do mentally just going to work every day now. Because mentally, I had a whole routine that I would go. I'm getting the thermoses ready, soup thermos, coffee thermos, all these layers ready. Mentally preparing to go outside, it makes a huge difference. Because now I don't dress up for nothing. I just, you know, I barely even put on a sweater because I just got to go to the car. It's no big deal. So then I complain the whole time to myself. Amen. Number four, they encourage each other. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. When was the last time we encouraged somebody? We could all do better to be encouraging the folks. When we walk into the church doors, are we looking to be encouraged? Or are we looking to be an encouragement to somebody? We, we know how it goes, but we don't live it. We know that it's more blessed to give than receive. We know at Christmas time, man, what a blessing it is to give people gifts. I mean, what a blessing that is, right? The problem is we don't live this in principle. 
Everywhere we go, we're just looking to get everything we can from everybody else. And there's not much giving going on, by and large, in general. Amen. There's no greater encouragement, church, no greater encouragement than being faithful. I'm not just talking to me, but I'm talking to the rest of the flock. I'm saying, encouraging one another, saying, Brother Tony, it's good to see you this morning. Amen. Adeline, your lip gloss looks amazing. <laughs> Amen. You know, encouraging one another. And, and yeah, even those little kids, you know, it, encourage them. I wouldn't want to go to church if nobody ever talked to me. Amen. Number five, they look out for one another. Turn to Galatians chapter one. Turn to Galatians one and Hebrews three. Try to move along quick here. Hebrew, uh, Galatians, <clears throat> sorry. Galatians chapter six, verse one and Hebrews chapter three. Number five, they look out for one another. And this is my final point for anybody that's looking for the end here. When one goose is wounded, and this is good, two geese will always fly down with that wounded goose, fly down wherever they go. And those two geese will stay as escorts to the wounded goose until they die, whether they're a shot or whatever, or to their, or to their, their until they can fly again, and then they'll get back up and go back with the same flock, or they'll find another flock to get with behind. I, I mean, I don't think I have to spell out the principle we can learn from that any better than what they do themselves. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, uh, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye an, uh, one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The problem is that we have more goose, geeses, we have more geese that are wounded And want to stay that way, that put a burden on everybody else that's trying to help. In today's society, and particularly with the younger folks, everybody's a victim. I mean, I mean, everybody's a victim, and it's always somebody else's fault every single time. No matter what the topic is, it's somebody else's fault. If, if, and I was making a joke to Rachel this morning. I forget what it was. Uh, I didn't do something or I forgot something, but I somehow made it her fault because she didn't remind me. Oh, that's what, because we've been married long enough. She should know that I would forget, forget what it was right now. So I put it on her, amen, jokingly. But we actually do that as a people, all the, particularly my, my age group. Well, it's, it's their fault that I'm bitter. Really? Even if somebody else wrongs you, you don't have to be bitter about it. You don't, whether you're in the wrong or the right. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you, uh, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hmm. We could stay there a while. Amen. Let's turn to a couple more scriptures. Um, hmm, let's do this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Ephesians 4, 13. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read you this. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he is fallen, for he hath not another to help him up. Do you guys see what he's teaching here? Don't be in your own formation. Be with the flock. There's the benefits of being with the flock. Look at verse 11. Again, if two lie together, they have, uh, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And three, four, cold is not quickly broken. Church, there's benefits of being in the flock. And if, and if you're sick or whatever, you're quarantining, that does not mean you don't have to be unplugged. But I think what happens a lot of the time, not all of the time, but a lot of the time in America, in the world that we're seeing right now, is Christians, well, I'm not at church, I'm completely unplugged. We, we, you say, what are you talking about? We don't, look, when you're not in the house of God, you don't know what the needs are. You don't know what the prayer requests are. You, you, you don't know that the Wilsons are moving. You, you don't know that 
uh, we're having a church decorating day. You don't know that uh, uh, you're not there to know what's going on with the nativity. You can be completely unplugged. We've had members that, that quarantined for a while, amen. And they didn't come to the church house physically for a while. They weren't unplugged. They, they were part of every service. They, they knew what was going on with the prayer list. They made sure they had a prayer list, that they were tithing, they were part of this and part of that as much as they possibly could. It doesn't mean you have to be unplugged. You should be at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Just till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by the slight of men and cut, cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You guys realize what they're talking about? That's whatever blog you were watching teaching doctrines that weren't the word of God. That's whatever YouTube you're watching. That's whatever person you were listening to. That's whatever friend was telling you, whatever this doctrine was that was contrary to the word of God because there's a lot of doctrines out there that say they're Christian, but they're not biblical and actually don't even have a biblical basis, but just that, well, our church fathers said this and said that. Paul's telling the Ephesians here, he's like, you guys need to not be babes anymore. It's time to grow up, study on your own, know what you believe so you're not swayed by what everybody says. Because it's very convincing. The less we know our Bible, it's really easy just to say, oh, well, it sounds good. You know, you know what? When they say that the church believes this and the church believes that and the church has done this for a thousand years, it's easy to say, well, that must be Bible. But we get swayed by language. Amen. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that uh, which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body and to the edifying of itself in love. Turn to Romans chapter 1, and we'll close here. Every church member ought to know, I mean, you'd have to be a real babe in Christ, and that's fine. And, and you're right, there's a time to be a babe in Christ. There's a, we all have to, you know what? There's a time to be a teenager. There's, there's a growing process, right? But, but we ought to not be saved for very long to realize, hey, there's, there's benefits of being in our V formation. There's benefits of being in the flock. I ought not try to go do things on my own. It's going to be way harder. Uh, it's going to be harder to flap my wings. It, I'm going to be more depressed because there's no encouragement. I've isolated myself from the rest of the flock. That happens all the time. It's important to know the benefits of being in the flock, but It's more important to even be in the flock. And you might say, well, what about those who don't know about being saved? What about those tribes in Africa or whatever part of the world that don't know about, they might say, your Western Christianity? God's blessed America because we've taken a stand on the Word of God, hands down. But the reply to that is, God wrote it upon the heart of every man, woman, and child that was ever born that there is a God. Besides that, all of creation points to a living God, points to a living creator. Everything that the trees, the flowers, the weeds, the grass are growing towards them, all the principles that we can learn from the different animals, and there's a lot of principles we can learn. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Look at this. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
The problem is, we as mankind, we suppress that. We want to we want to say, no, I don't want to believe that because if I believe that, now i got to put myself under a living God. And th that living God, now all of a sudden, it's not my standards of right or wrong because my standards say, well, I'm going to compare myself among ourselves. God says that's not wise. And all of a sudden, our standards would, would squeak us by on a judgment day. But the problem is to acknowledge that we have a creator. Acknowledge God for who he is because every lost person knows that there's a God. This verse tells me that that's true. They want to deny it because they don't want to put themselves under the law of God and realize how much of a sinner that they are, that we are, how we're absolutely born in sin. If it were, if were come to judgment day, man, we would fail on pretty much all the Ten Commandments. Amen. We would, we would be uh, uh, sinners so far deep in sin. But you have to understand that first before you can understand the grace of God. And that's a major part of the nativity that we're going to be having. Why did God send his son for a people that just doesn't deserve nothing? Because I don't think I'd send any one of my boys. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. And then furthermore, he adds this. He says, for the invisible things of him, talking about God from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who, who is without excuse? Everyone that's ever been born. You say, what do you mean without excuse? They're without excuse to not accept God for who he is, to not accept Jesus Christ for who he is and what he did for us. Understanding that we're sinners in need of a Savior and there's no hope uh, without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We hit, this, we hit the Romans road very hard Wednesday night. And we should, we should know these verses, but Romans 10.10, 10, with the heart, man, uh, believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and I hope we'll be using these verses a lot in a couple of weeks three verses later it says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved church we can learn a lot from creation if we just pay attention the problem is we're wrapped up in our phones and we're wrapped up on this and we're busy doing this there's never been I'd venture to say, I think I could be bold enough to say, a generation that's ever been so busy doing nothing. We're busy running and running and running and running. And by and large, we're doing nothing. All of creation points to the creator. It begs the question, does our life point to the king of kings or king me first? I think if we were to all stand before God right now and be honest with ourselves, there's a whole lot less King of Kings worship going on and a whole lot more King Me First going on. Whether we're backslidden Christians, which oftentimes that's the case, or if we're in need of a Savior and we're just now realizing that, hey, I'm a wicked sinner and I need Jesus Christ in my life. If that's the case, I pray you'd come down the altar this morning and get that right. Hey, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not where you should be uh, in your relationship with Christ, I pray you get that right. Hey, if there's somebody on your heart that you need to be praying for, I pray you come down the altar and get that right. Let's go to the word, Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time. Lord, we're a needy people. We are unworthy of anything that you've ever done for us, let alone.